if anybody told me that at my age I should go fishing with a man who had been fishing more than 20 years longer than I had, I wouldn't believe him. But this was the day, and this is the man. And as you can see, he's very old indeed. And if you want to know how old he is, I tell you, he's 100 years old. And he'd been fishing the River Froome since he was 10. I think he caught his last salmon at about the age of 95, then he lost his wife, and he thought perhaps that he would never fish again. But <coughs> when it came round to his 100th birthday and his telegram from the Queen, his friend, Bill Brewer, and, and Bill's boy, Barry Brewer, the keeper, said to him, wouldn't it be a good idea if he landed a fish on his 100th birthday? And he thought he'd have a go. So here he is. It's extraordinary to think of what life has been to a man like that over the years. When I tell you that this man, George Dunton, played three times for England against Germany at soccer before the First World War. And more than that, he was not only a great soccer player as well as a great fisherman, but he was also a great cricketer. And he actually took the wicket of Dr. W.G. Grace. At least he thought he'd take the wicket of Dr. W.G. Grace because he was playing against Dr. W.G. Grace's 11 and he was put on to bowl and he had the old boy out perfectly clearly, LBW, and he appealed, and the umpire said, not out. And at the end of the match, they all came up to him and said, you don't appeal against the doctor if you want to be asked again. And indeed, more than that, the man with whom he opened the batting against W. G. Grace's 11, because George was a batsman as well as a bowler, was called Jack Hobbs. And now, unexpectedly, I think, he's getting out the fishing tackle that he'd put away, and it's a beautiful old tackle. It's very old-fashioned by modern standards, but it's superb, handmade, hardest fly rod of the old sort. And a very heavy rod, incidentally. And this is his other friend, Chris Dyer, and we brought Chris along because we thought he must get tired. None of us can imagine what it's like to be a hundred years old. And you sometimes have to fish a long time to connect with a fish. So Chris came along as spare fisherman in order that if exhaustion overtook old George, he could keep fishing and still make, you, uh, make sure that he had a fish to land. And we stood there, all of us, and watched with astonishment that he could still tie knots in gut at the age of, uh, or nylon as it now is, still tied knots in nylon at the age of a hundred without glasses. Amazing. I wish I had eyes like that now. As I say, we're standing on the banks of the River Froome, which is in Dorset, and uh, he's known it so long that uh, he knew exactly where he wanted to come to, and he knew exactly where he said in these particular conditions of water at this time of the year there would be a fish. And he also tied the fly on without the faintest difficulty. And he was very fussy about the way his gas gaff was hung on him and he insisted because he doesn't move so good nowadays and having the old wading staff with the net on it which he used to use in the old days when he was wading the water with a rough bottom 
And then he walked to the point where his experience told him this particular day might produce a fish. And who were we to argue with him? Now, using tackle of that sort is quite heavy work. A, a big, old-fashioned salmon rod of that sort is very heavy tool to handle. But George is a perfect example of what we were all taught when we first began to learn to cast a fly, which was that it's the timing that matters. A beginner, a strong young beginner, would find this rod difficult to use. But because his timing is perfect, he manages very well. You see how he works out a yard of line at every second cast or so in order to search the pool. This is the classical way of searching a salmon pool. And they always taught us that uh, you should never try to get length, because if you do, you'll start slashing and working. You should try and make a perfect cast. And if you could get the time exactly right, it's just like a golf swing or many, many of the other sports. It's no accident that a man is good at a number of sport. And by God, he moved a fish. He was right. A salmon turned over to his fly that time. Wouldn't it be wonderful if he had it on? And look at those. Flies of every sort all tied by George himself, all in perfect condition. Mind you, of course, he's had an awful lot of time to sort them out, clear them out in recent years. But look, from the tiniest dry flies to the big heavy water salmon flies, some of those are better over 40 years old. Well, he didn't get the salmon on the fly. It wouldn't come again, so he decided he wanted to spin. And once again, his spinning tackle was just as old, but just as perfect. And he was well able to handle it. I knew there was at least one fish in that pool because we'd seen him bring it up and turn it over at the fly. And he was determined to get it if he could. And he did, in fact, move it again. By this time, it was too much for him, and he sat down in a deck chair, which we provided, and he went to sleep for an hour and a half. And when he woke up, he said he wanted to start again. And we said, no, you've had enough of the big tackle. Come over to the Trout Lakes. So we took him to the Paddington Lakes, which lie behind, and this was the perfect place, because this is one of the best of the stillwater trout fisheries of the south of England, in particular because it has stocked this particular lake with real brown trout of the sort that live in English rivers. Most of these things tend to, tend to be stuck nowadays with the imported rainbow. And we knew that an, a fly fisherman of his standing would be contemptuous of the rainbow. And we wanted him to have the real thing. And unfortunately, for some reason or other, we couldn't get the browns to move. He was soon resting again, and Chris and I were fishing either side. It was like being a king, isn't it? Sit in your throne and have two fishermen fishing on your behalf on either side. But we were determined that he was once again going to feel the feel of a fish on the hook. And Chris has got one. Yes. Now we have to persuade him to take it. Of course, this is very few fishermen's pride will allow them to do this. But. Uh, I think the idea of actually feeling a fish on the line was too much for him. So we did manage to persuade him. And I've 
look of dreadful joy came on his face as he felt the fish throbbing on the end of the line once more. And he handled it absolutely splendidly. Well, why wouldn't he? He'd had it longer than we have. It wasn't very big, but it was a fish, which means that the first objective of the day was achieved. Well, he's been photographed with many finer fish than that in his long life, but I don't think actually any one of them ever meant so much to him. And in the meanwhile, I thought, well, we, we might be able to get him a bigger one. We might be able to get him a bigger one. And he certainly didn't want to go, uh, yes, I have. He didn't want to go home, and in the end, I had one which certainly I knew was a better fish. Yes, this one might tax him a bit more, I think. But he didn't tax him at all. He took it at exactly the right pace. He knew to give it a bit more than the other one, but he punished it quite hard. He didn't mess about. And he brought it into the net absolutely perfectly. Careful. We don't want to lose it. We shan't lose it. There you are. That's exactly how you should play a fish out and then bring it to the net. Well, that was the centenary fishing day of George Dunton, MBE, born in 1881. I asked him, incidentally, how he got the MBE, and he said, oh, it was just for dealing with a couple of ruffians. I'd love to hear the full story of that. But there it was, and he did me a very great favour, because for one day, he made me feel very young indeed. I'm glad we took him out. Cheer.